I tell you what, it's, it's not, not like, like the olden, olden days. days. I'm Jake. I'm Rosie. And this is our podcast on the Look Who's Talking film series. Film trilogy that never fell into the fatal trap of making a rubbish fourth one to go with it. And the three films were released in 1989, Look Who's Talking, 1990, Look Who's Talking 2, and 1993, a little gap there, Look Who's Talking Now. And it was one of the things, when we were quite young, that our mum showed us or thought we might like or thought might keep us quiet or we wouldn't annoy her while she watched it if she let us watch it too. It was that sort of thing. And it certainly worked, because we did enjoy it then, and we do enjoy it now. I remember seeing the first two movies quite close together, and of course they were made very close together. I wonder if our mum had recorded the first one off the telly, like she often did with films she wanted to watch. And we recorded the second one on an ITV movie premiere not long afterwards, I think. Well, I saw the second one first, and I think another time, after we'd got Look Who's Talking 2 on video, they showed the original, and I thought, oh, finally, I've been wanting to see that. I wouldn't say with any certainty that I hadn't seen the second one first as well, actually. So they very much did come as a package for us, but as I say, our mother was quite right, I think, that we would be entertained, amused, engaged by the hook of, you can hear the thought of the children, the babies in the movies, and it's very amusing in that way, and that's certainly the aspect of it one enjoys as a younger viewer. But of course, like things like Ghostbusters, particularly the first movie isn't made with a family audience, younger audience in mind. It was written and directed by a lady, Amy Heckerling, and is told from the point of view of a young-ish professional woman in New York City. Her story of how she has this baby, Mikey, and her life progresses from that point. And it makes a lot of very interesting comments about being a young professional woman in New York and being a person living in the world. And when the babies come along, being a young person person and seeing the world from that point of view and thoughts being expressed in the voiceover and that makes a good mix and a good film that we've always enjoyed from those couple of perspectives at varying ages. And of course the actress who played the young-ish professional woman I was talking about main protagonist in many ways, certainly in the first movie, even though she's credited second, not being as famous as John Travolta, is Kirsty Alley. And I knew her at the time from Cheers, which I used to be in the room when the parents would watch. And as I've mentioned, the other main star is John Travolta, and I don't know if we'd already seen Reese or were aware of him at all. Our parents used to go around saying, oh look, he's dancing in it. He always has to dance in all these movies. He says the dance and I suppose that's true in many ways, but it was always obvious that John Travolta as James in these movies was very amusing, and as I sometimes say, particularly when thinking about movies like the Disney animated 2008 movie Bolt, John Travolta is, I think, a very good actor. I find him more entertaining as an actor and comedy actor than a dancer myself, and perhaps he would like to hear that. Well, I'm certain that Look Who's Talking 2 was the first time I ever saw Kirsty Alley or John Travolta, and I think I recognised him as James from Look Who's Talking when I saw Grease. And actually, if you have a mind to, you can read about John Travolta getting terribly swollen-headed after his success in Saturday Night Fever and saying he wouldn't do the movie if he couldn't do a certain amount of scene or dancing, so after I read that I had quite a low opinion of him for a while, but I think by the time he got on to look who's talking, he'd mellowed a bit, and if you do watch him doing an interview or anything, he's very engaging and seems very down to earth, so I guess we'll forgive him for his youthful folly, and the children absolutely love him, don't they? They find him 
him very stimulating. They're always smiling and laughing when he's engaging with them in scenes for the movie. So, as you may be able to tell from what we've just been saying, John Travolta and Kirstie Alley do an excellent job carrying the three movies and being the two leads and coming together their characters as a couple and raising their family and being the heart of the movie and good for them. It was interesting this time when we just watched DVDs of them over the past few weeks, how it really struck me for the first time. I mean, I knew it was an issue part of the film in a way, but I was really thinking about it in quite some depth. How in Look Who's Talking, the first movie, James changes Molly's mind about what constitutes a good man, a good father, good person. Of course, if you didn't realise and you weren't really listening to Molly's friend Rona saying she and James have been together for a year and a half, when Mikey is already two, that James isn't Mikey's biological father. In fact, Molly's been very unprofessional and had an affair with one of her accounting clients. And at one point she reels off a list of reasons why he's a suitable father for Mikey. He's rich and successful and he has experience with children because he's actually married and he's got two daughters. But he's also stringing Molly along saying he's going to leave his wife and not leaving her. And then just before Molly goes goes into labour, she finds him at it with his interior decorator, so obviously he's the kind of guy who'll just bonk anyone who comes to work with him. And obviously Molly wants to believe that Albert is a good man, potentially a good father for Mikey, but you can tell she's kind of kidding herself. It has quite a few fantasy sequences, all three movies, little inserts to tell you how the characters are feeling about certain things, and Molly's imagining to herself Albert's finally getting a divorce from his wife. It cuts across to Molly and she's all got old makeup and grey hair and stuff. And we're like, yeah, Molly's kidding herself. She thought Albert was a good man, a safe financial and emotional bet to be her future, but she's found out he's not. He's a sleaze. And her definition of a good man changes. It could be a cab driver who is Italian-American and is a bit of a chancer, a bit of a scammer, you know, there's a hundred ways to get a free lunch in New York and that sort of thing. The first time she's thinking about getting together with James and she has this fantasy flash forward where they have tons of children and he's been out getting their dinner from the dumpster by the supermarket and she's developed a Brooklyn accent to go with their lifestyle. But then of course she realises later on what makes James a good person, a suitable husband and father. So she very much changes her perspective during the movie. I think it's worth saying Albert is held entirely accountable for his actions. Molly says that she loves him, though she's kidding herself. She believes he's going to leave his wife. In other movies, Molly would be just portrayed as a homewrecker and a total bitch, wouldn't she? And of course there is one of those, and look who's talking now, as we'll mention in a bit. Albert is played by George Seagal, who had evidently been in quite a few movies by that point in the 70s and 80s. I was looking him up the other week and discovered that now, in the present time, when we're recording this podcast, he's 85 years old, so he was playing younger to play Albert. Albert's supposed to be about 45, isn't he, rather than 55. He's got two daughters, 11 and 9. He's about 10 years older than Molly. But there we are, it certainly worked in the movie. And the other main cast members in the first movie are Twink Kaplan, and you mentioned her character, Rona, Molly's friend and co-worker from the accountancy firm, and Olympia Dukakis, who is the third actor to appear in all three movies, as well as John Travolta and Kirstie Alley. She plays Molly's mum, Rosie, and of course there's the whole thing about James isn't really suitable, they look down their nose at him a bit. Well, certainly the mum does. Molly's dad doesn't say very much. And James sometimes feels he's being forced to try and prove himself to the parents-in-law. And it's a familiar situation, that sort of family relationship, but it works quite well in the movie. Of course, in the second one, James is a bit resentful because Rosie pulls some strings to get him this corporate pilot job. He's really 
really a pilot wants to be a professional pilot, James. He doesn't particularly like driving his cab, and that's his big dream and what he's chasing towards throughout the movies. So there's a bit of tension there. A familiar family setup, but it certainly works. And it's particularly nice in the third movie, I think, how you can tell that Rosie and James are very comfortable with each other, and there's no real remaining animosity between them, and Rosie's the one to say to Molly, come on, you know what kind of a man James is, he's not going to be cheating on you, is he? So they're very much a functioning, happy family who've learned from each other and all become better people for it by that point. And of course, the other big cast member in the first movie, and indeed the second movie, is Bruce Willis as the voice of Mikey. And I've always enjoyed his performance as Mikey. I do think Bruce Willis is, like John Travolta, very good at comedy bits and the things he does. Obviously, Bruce Willis is well known as a kind of action star particularly in Die Hard with his best. But he's very funny, isn't he? As Mikey, he's funny in Pulp Fiction, and so is John Travolta. And he does some very funny work as Mikey in both first two movies. And I was a bit disappointed when Look Who's Talking Now came out, and they were like, oh, the children are older. And I thought, oh, it's not going to have Bruce Willis in the voice of Mikey, then it'll be missing something. And I suppose it is, in a way. But it would have been silly to try and force that aspect in anymore, as I'm sure we'll say fully in just a few moments. We were saying, weren't we, in the second movie, the younger child particularly, the one-year-old, doesn't get given as much actual acting to do as the child playing Mikey in the first movie. He has to react to people, he has to call an elevator and get on this trolley with the fruit cups in the old people's home. And we were speculating that maybe Bruce Willis's performance, when they look back, made them realise, well, you don't really have to get the child to do things that are going to sync up with the lines. Bruce Willis reacts so well to what the child is doing and if you put them in a scene they'll give enough action for the actors to work on. In the second movie the child playing Mikey is a bit older and he has a few lines doesn't he? Like, I'm stairs and penis. No penis, which makes sense in the context of the scene. And he has to be scared of the toilet, which also makes sense in the context of the scene. But the little one-year-old playing his sister, Julie, just really sort of sits around. And Roseanne Barr articulates whatever she's thinking, like when she's getting her injection. Going, what's that? Oh my god! That's how you react to your first injection, isn't it? Very much so. And that's really what is so good about it, if you're coming at it from the point of view of hearing the baby's thoughts, that they very much ring true with the sorts of things that happen to us in real life when early childhood experiences, like getting inoculated. I like that scene where in the first movie they're changing Mikey's diaper. Bruce Willis talks right over what Molly and Rosie are saying, doesn't he? He's saying, after a new diaper, I really like some of that white stuff on me, and the baby's kind of grabbing at this powder that they've got, and he's saying, give it to me and I'll put it on. Funny. Mm, he really is articulating the acting baby's thoughts. I wonder how much freedom they gave him with his script. Obviously, he took quite a lot of freedom with it. And it really, really worked. And as you said, I think that did influence how they came to the sequel and how Bruce Willis and Roseanne reacting to what the children are doing. So as a hook, something that really hadn't been done before, Mikey's thoughts in the voice of Bruce Willis certainly work. And then adding in Julie's thoughts in the voice of Roseanne certainly adds another level to that for Look Who's Talking To. And I was always quite titillated by the spelling of To as T-O-O for the sequel. Damon Wyans as the voice of Mikey's friend Eddie. He's very funny talking about doing his potty training and wearing the trainer pants man and all that kind of thing. And all that does ring very true, doesn't it? And even when you're older, you don't have to be toilet training to relate to, you say to your pee-pee, I know you're in there, but you ain't coming out till I say so. The pee-pee just listens to you? Well, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And we all... <laughs> so true. That's so true, and it doesn't really stop with age. And when we were younger, though, we enjoyed Look Who's Talking. We always preferred Look Who's Talking too. 
even though now that we're older, I certainly think, and I think you agree with me, Look Who's Talking is probably a better movie. It's got more plot. It's certainly got more runtime and more stuff going on. But when we were little, we so related to Look Who's Talking too. It's true. Look Who's Talking is a lot more rounded. It has, as you say, a plot. The characterization is deeper, better. But, yes, it is extremely relatable, Look Who's Talking to, if you've got, if you are, a couple of siblings. And I think that's probably the most successful aspect of that movie. You do want to come to it from that perspective, rather than, I'm a professional white young woman in New York, here's this movie that I might be able to relate to. I think you'll be able to relate much more to the first one. And I think that's why Look Who's Talking Now is aimed much more at a family audience. And look who's talking to really is that bridge. You were just reminding me, and look who's talking, James is smoking, isn't he? And then, like Ghostbusters, going into Ghostbusters. Two, there's no cigarettes at all. It was really striking me watching Look Who's Talking now, how they weren't smoking. Swearing as well. Casually drinking. And yes, the swearing did strike me. John Travolta's first line in the whole franchise in Look Who's Talking is a swear word, a swear explanation, and it's very funnily delivered. It's brilliant. She's in labour getting into his cab, and uh, he does that and goes shooting off. Fantastic introduction to the character. Yes, and of course the first impression she has of of him is he drives her very dangerously through New York, through building sites and all sorts to rush her to the hospital. And before she can go in and have the baby, she has to whack him with her handbag for ages, saying, you stupid idiot. So that's the first step on her discovering what really makes a good man a good father. If you hadn't seen the movie and you were listening to us, you might wonder how they got to be a couple from him driving her to the hospital in his cab while she's in labour. And there's this whole complicated thing about how she leaves her purse in the cab so he brings it round and then he's using her address to get his grandfather into this really good old people's home where they only let you go there if you're posh or perhaps it's if you live nearby which I didn't understand or bother to try to understand at all when I was young. No I really didn't get that either and Molly has to go in and straighten out the business with the mistake with the candy that happens with James's grandfather and she's referring to him as my husband and I think why is she saying that? They're not married yet. They're not a couple yet. They're nearly there. But of course, it's all one of James's scams, but a very good hearted one to look after his grandfather. And that's why Molly's helping him out with it. And in return, she gets free babysitting. And that's how he forms a bond with Mikey. And Mikey wants him to be his daddy, which a girl in the sandbox or something has to explain to him. And I like her definition of a daddy, the big man type who hang around with the mommy. Oh, well maybe I'll ask James to be my daddy. And that's a very good idea. Ask someone you like to be your daddy rather than get stuck with the crap when you were given at birth, which is true in Mikey's case, that he has one of those, and so do many of the rest of them. Speaking of which, the movies start with conception, don't they? Just a little bit of preamble, how you get there, and then in some ways it's quite educational with all the sperm swimming and going and finding the egg, but in some ways it's quite misleading because it tells you that conception happens in the womb, and that isn't true at all. Get out! This is my womb! Yeah, where have they been swimming before they get to the diaphragm? That makes no sense at all so I found that in some ways quite educational and in some ways a bit confusing and so I found out more when I got older. That is true. It's certainly striking and different and new and amusing and an interesting way to start off the whole hearing the baby's thoughts thing. In the first one, as you were saying, the egg has nothing to say and the sperms just have their song. But in the second one they really take that a long way and they have Kirstie Alley doing the voice of the egg and John Travolta doing all the sperms and complaining about the diaphragm. Hey guys, I found a way through. And then they morph together and it becomes the voice of Roseanne Barr, which is quite clever and striking and certainly adds a lot to the uniqueness of the movies. And they do include it in Look Who's Talking Now with the dogs, which I had been hoping they would the first time we watched Look Who's Talking Now. You get a bit of family stuff going on first and then you go to the dogs and you get the old sperm and egg sequence. And then I remember watching it the first time and thinking, shouldn't there be more than one egg? If I it's, thought the same! If it's dogs. And, I mean, you can really tell the animation 
computer graphics is quite different. First, you get the reused footage from the first movie, not the second movie. Obviously, the dog doesn't have a diaphragm in. And then when all the new eggs drop in, hey, there's loads of them. That's all the new animation, specially tailored for the situation with the dogs. So that works out rather well. And the dog being conceived, along with his brothers and sisters, as his mother says, is Rox. And he is the product of a purebred spaniel who somehow got out and some street dog who does emotional rape on her by saying that he's going to get neutered, basically. I got an appointment with the vet tomorrow. I may not make it. Which you couldn't do now. You certainly can't laugh at it now. She gives in the mother dog and he goes, <laughs> bingo. And I say, that's not okay. Because it really isn't. Before we get on to look who's talking now exclusively, the build-up of James and Molly's relationship through the first movie with the stuff with the nursing home, the grandfather and the babysitting, and Molly dating a load of other douchebags who make a lot of money but aren't as good as James. She has flash-forwards about them and what terrible fathers they're going to be. And there's one who's kind of anal. She thinks he's going to be telling Mikey he's not organising his drawers properly when he's going to shout at him for not doing well in school or well enough in school, like he's been shouting at the waiter in the restaurant. That all rings very true, and their relationship builds up very nicely. But then, as has been mentioned in Look Who's Talking To, there isn't as much of that plot and characterisation. They have a bit of a wobble in their marriage. James moves out for a while. I mentioned the issue of the commercial pilot job got by the mother, and they're arguing about things like parenting and money. One thing I did notice, it's never mentioned in the second movie, and obviously it's not an issue, which is a good thing, that James isn't Mikey's biological father. They don't mention Albert or the fact that anyone else out there might have provided the sperm in the whole movie. And there's this bit where I always thought they were going to, where they're arguing about undermining each other in front of Mikey, and it seems like they might be going that direction, but it turns out it's because Molly earns more money, and that's why she should care more what Mikey does if he goes to baby gym, which is going to cost them more money. It's nothing to do with with biology, as indeed is quite correct, true family is not to do with biology. You can maybe work it out if you really listen when Rona and Molly are having a conversation and Molly says she and James have been together a year and a half and she is already noticeably pregnant with Julie. And Mikey is obviously a lot more than a year and a half old. And in Look Who's Talking Now as well, they say they've been together six years and if James is Mikey's biological father, the most he could be is five and a quarter. So there's hints, but at one point we were saying, well, perhaps I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen the first movie. Yes, and they do talk about it as specifically as they're going to ever in Look Who's Talking Now, when James mentions her affair with one of her clients, married clients, and then George the girl makes a cameo in a fantasy sequence. Oh, Albert. But it's not actually spelled out on screen. You might not completely realise he's Mikey's biological father and it might not completely spoil the first movie for you if you haven't seen it yet. Of course, if you did see only the third movie, very much family Christmas movie, and then went back to the first, you'd go, what the hell is this? It's a very different kind of movie. The other character, of course, in Look Who's Talking to is Uncle Stuart, and he's also one of the causes of conflict between Molly and James because she's letting him stay in the house. He has a gun. It's not loaded. James doesn't think he should have it anyway. Just the stupid thing people say when they accidentally kill somebody. They say, oh, I didn't think it was loaded. And there's this whole scene where he's running through the things that Stuart does that piss him off, which is also very relatable if you've got someone like that living with you. He drinks everything but a drop and then he puts it back. He takes bites out of everything and then he puts it back. That was always very funny and relatable. And sometimes I think, could they really have done without Uncle Stuart? I always think he's the in order to get together with Rona and potentially provide babies who would be first cousins to Mikey and Julie for the third movie. They're very much thinking of that, aren't they? Oh, Stuart, let's get married. And Rona's been talking about how she wants to have children quite soon. Biological clock is ticking. Mm, 
Molly's holding newborn Julie and saying, you're next to Rona. Which reminds me, the conception sequences were made different so that it would still be interesting and so were the birth sequences. Mikey is born vaginally, the traditional way, and uh, Julie's in some trouble and has to be born by caesarean. Which they do, I think, just to vary things a bit. Yes, Mikey was saying something to Julie about the long trip down the birth canal and we noticed, oh yes, he assumes that's how you come into the world because that's what happened to him. But of course, Julie doesn't know what a trip down the birth canal is, but that's not something they go into. That's a very funny bit when Mikey's coming to meet Julie and he's talking to her, Bruce Willis is talking, and then it cuts to the shot of Julie being a newborn baby. Roseanne Barr goes, who's this asshole? And that's what you think when you see your big brother, isn't it? Very much so. Getting back to Uncle Stewart, anyway, one thing he does do, as well as provide some of the reason for conflict between James and Molly is that he provides the jeopardy at the end by burning down the kitchen and all three movies have some kind of jeopardy at the climax that's another thing that's part of the structure in the first movie Mikey's out all over the streets this one year old looking for James and nearly getting run over the second movie Uncle Stuart's trying to cook them dinner and then chasing this burglar and leaving this three year old and one year old alone in the apartment and burning the kitchen down Mikey's assessment of Uncle Stuart in that scene is very good that bonehead Uncle Stuart so I'm going to have to save Julie myself and he does it's a particularly funny bit after that end jeopardy in the first movie isn't it where all the cars have crashed into to each other to try and avoid Mikey and James comes and picks Mikey up and Mikey goes, hey James, did you see what just happened? He has absolutely no idea it was because of him. When I first used to watch the movies, I wasn't at all sure if the grown-ups were supposed to be able to hear the babies communicate with the babies or if it was just their thoughts. I think I got it quite it's a giveaway in Look Who's Talking too, where Mikey does communicate with his parents, as you were saying, quite a lot by talking out loud to them and saying penis, no penis, calling mommy daddy when he successfully used the toilet for the first time. But of course, as should be obvious from what we've been saying, the babies, children can communicate with each other through their thoughts or perhaps through their baby burbling. It reminds me of Rugrats in that way. Babies can communicate with each other, but not the adults and in Look Who's Talking to Mikey is getting to the kind of age that Angelica is and Rugrats he can communicate with the adults but still communicate with the babies as well so that all rings very true. They do some very good scenes without even any adults with them don't they? That scene with the toys where Mikey's telling Julie she can't play with his toys and she's saying jeez he's always so mean to me she cries because he's making her play with stupid balls instead of this cool sort of car thing. I like it. And he says, oh, don't cry again. And we both relate to that scene, don't we? Yes, it rings so true. It reminds me of how the scene with the advert for the Cobra Hammerhead and look who's talking to rings very true as well. It's sending up how the toy adverts get the children hooked. And Mikey says, wow, I need a Cobra Hammerhead. And of course, Julie wants a Cobra Hammerhead too. And Mikey's like, it's for boys. And did you tell me once, I was thinking this earlier when we were watching Look Who's Talking Now, perhaps the dogs communicating with each other through thought was a bit dodgier than the babies doing it. You can kind of see Mikey and Julie burbling at each other, opening their mouths, and that's how they communicate most of the time. Whereas the dogs are kind of talking to each other through thoughts, and they can do it through the glass door onto the balcony and stuff, and it's not quite the same thing. I might have said that. Of course, dogs have their own ways of communicating, like when Daphne is coming to assess Rox's wounds when he's been fighting a wolf in that jeopardy towards the end. She's sniffing bits of him and Diane Keaton is saying, oh, your ears, your little ears and your neck. Bits like that work okay. Maybe sometimes they're saying more than they could really make each other understand, but if I ever cared about that, I don't now. I don't think it matters. I was reminded of it during that bit that I was mentioning the glass door because she's teaching him commands through it, isn't she? That's right, she's using actual words. She's saying when they say sit, that means you put your butt on the floor and your front leg straight, so he does that. And you think are they communicating all that through looks? Yes, she does demonstrate so that's okay, but then using the word sit perhaps carries it a bit beyond that boundary. But of 
course, that doesn't matter at all, particularly when you're young. That never used to bother either of us at all, and I was only just slightly reminded of it today while we were watching the good talk now, and I don't think it's a problem at all, but I thought just worth mentioning. As I said earlier, Look Who's Talking Now has the gap, the three-year gap, after the first two movies having been made back-to-back, 89, 90, 93, and, well, John Travolta and Kirsty Alley do look a bit more middle-aged in it. Not that that matters at all, nor was it really worth mentioning, but you can see a little time has passed. Can't really tell with Olympia Dukakis, she was quite old anyway. But obviously it was made in the response to the kind of family audience that the first two films attracted, because it is a family Christmas movie, really. We never manage to watch it at Christmas, do we? Watch it today, it's August. And I remember it being new, coming out in the cinema on video, and us already having and being very familiar with and having recorded on video, look who's talking and look who's talking too, and like, oh right, a new Look Who's Talking movie. What a shame it won't have Bruce Willis. Maybe it'll be okay. Who's going to be talking in it? Perhaps now is a good time to mention that you did read Twink Kaplan and Uncle Stewart. I forget his name. Elias Kateus? Declined to be in Look Who's Talking now. And that makes me think they were approached with the idea of the two of them having another baby. And I think they were right to think that that wasn't a good idea if that's what it was because they did that already. So if that's the case, it's a bit like Back to the Future with Chris Ben Glover refusing to do the sequels, and you find out that it was going to have a really stupid rehash of the same plot. It's a good thing because they've come up with a better idea. Yeah, it really would have been retreading old ground unnecessarily, having more talking babies. And doing it with the dogs instead is actually a very good idea because it is different but the same basic idea, an extension of the idea that is interesting and new and refreshing to see. Your DVD case, I was interested to read, describes Look Who's Talking Now as as fresh and funny as the original. And perhaps it's not as funny as the original, certainly not in the same way, but it is as fresh as the original, practically, because it does something fresh with the idea, and it works very well. Dogs are very expressive with their actions and facial expressions and so on, and it works very well with the two dogs. I think I mentioned Diane Keaton as Daphne, didn't I? And also, you get Danny DeVito as Rock. And they make an excellent Look Who's Talking duo. That's so true. They do a lot of good interaction with each other, talking, and more traditionally doggy things as well. That part where Rox takes Daphne out to help her loosen up and have a night on the town was always a highlight. One of those doggy date scenes like in Lady and the Tramp and Beethoven Second, they're always good to watch. But they also have very good interactions, both dogs, with the human cast. Molly pouring out Daphne's Evian, she's very pampered poodle and Daphne going oh take it away the dogs push the bowl away Molly saying drink it like that she obviously tried other kinds of water with her and Rox does some rather engaging traditionally boyish interaction with Mikey that really makes you believe in them as a young guy and his pet there's a Rox misbehaving montage where he's stealing meat off this tray that's been put up on a high kitchen counter he's saying I don't know why they put my dish up so high because that's what the dog would think. And yes, the dog's thoughts do ring quite as true as the baby's when Rox first arrives in the house and jumps on the couch. Hey, a cool cushy thing to sleep on. Maybe I'll just dig all the crap out of the middle of it. And you know he will. It's the same basic idea as the baby's thoughts of how they see the world, but done with dogs and works in a slightly different way and is refreshing. Very, very good. And there are parallels one can draw between Daphne and Rox's relationship and Molly and James's relationship in the first movie and in fact they do that in the script. I was wondering if they were going to. I couldn't remember if they did. I was thinking about it, watching Look Who's Talking Now just now, having, I suppose, particularly thought in a way I never had before about James and Molly's relationship in the first movie. I really noticed how it was kind of 
parallel with Rox and Daphne. And then, of course, Molly does spell it out for us, sympathising with Daphne. You miss Rox? Yeah, I know how you feel. And there's conflict between the two dogs at first. He's come off the street, and Daphne comes from James's new boss, Samantha, who we'll talk about, who's rich and posh and has got this very expensive purebred poodle. And then they learn from each other. Rox learns to behave himself around the house, and Daphne learns not to be such a snob. And she's introduced when this character, Samantha, brings her, unlike Rox, who's introduced from a puppy. It's mainly sort of his perspective. But uh, you couldn't really follow Daphne from a puppy. It's hard to think how to get her in unless she's just dumped on them, which she is by the home-wrecking bitch played by Lizette Anthony, and she always plays that character. She plays the same basic home-wrecker in Jonathan Creek and Poirot episodes. It was striking me this time how if Molly and her mother weren't right about Samantha, then they'd be doing her a bit of a disservice. Yes, she's harsh, a bit tactless, but if she didn't turn out to be a homewrecker, she was trying to be quite kind. James mentions that Mikey wants a dog and Samantha gives them her dog. Obviously, it's not really a suitable family dog, the sort of dog that Mikey wants, at least not yet, but Samantha doesn't understand that. She was doing her best. But, yes, of course, it turns out she has been trying to ensnare James and is abusing her position of authority. And is that homewrecking character that Molly and Rose he believed her to be. Otherwise, they look like completely unreasonable women. Speaking of which, it does have different writers, the third movie. The first one, Amy Heckling wrote by herself. The second one, she got someone to help her. Perhaps she was running out of ideas, or perhaps she wasn't so confident with the family genre, I don't know. And she directs both of those. And the third one has new writers, new director. But she is co-producer, so she's still involved. Yes, I was interested to be reminded today that it is co-producer, Amy Heckling has rather than executive producer. If it was executive producer, I think it was some sort of courtesy credit. I mean, she didn't really do any work on it, but co-producer, obviously she did do some work on Lucky's Talking Now, and rightly so. So any kind of leaning toward the stereotypical jealous wife, catty woman Molly might be doing is down to the new writers, I think, but Kirsty Alley does a lot to kind of counter any of that, I think, by continuing to play the character with her interpretation and making the performance her own and carrying on as she was before. I think they do a good job in the first two movies of presenting a balance in the problems in the marriage. Neither one of them is completely right or completely wrong. They're neither of them perfect. They've both brought certain issues to the marriage and the family, which they end up working through together. So thankfully, Kirsty Alley's performance manages to maintain that aspect of the relationship between the two characters in the third movie, even though, yes, it's more difficult for actresses not to play silly, jealous, catty women when men are writing for them, as we have spotted in so many things. It's a shame for Liz S. Anthony, really, that she's been typecast as that character because she's a good actress, I think, and some of Samantha's lines make us laugh, though they are in the vein of I'm trying to seduce someone else's husband. It was very funny, I think, the last time we watched it, re-watched it, before this time, when we weren't expecting it, when Rosie has said, I know people, I can get her audited in the same sort of tone of voice as I know people I can have a rubbed out or something. But this is how accountants get their revenge on you or snipe at you. They have you audited. And we're not particularly expecting anything to come of that, but James is talking on the phone and then it pans over to Lizette Anthony going, what do you mean I'm being audited now? It isn't even tax season and that made us laugh and not when we weren't expecting it. That's something else consistent across the three movies, of course, something about tax season. At Christmas, it's not tax season, but they get it in that way. I hope Rosie just went ahead and did that after Molly said no and Molly didn't change her mind just to be petty. It's the sort of thing Rosie would do as a kind of pushy mother-in-law. By the way, it really struck me when we were watching the Who's Talking to how many characters are actually accountants. Molly and, as James says, her brother are both accountants. Because they dearly love it. Yes, saying that their parents control their lives. We dearly love being accountants. That brings very true as well. That's hard to believe, isn't it? So Stuart, Molly, Rona, she's one too, and both of Molly's parents, all accountants, five pretty much principal characters. 
Speaking of Molly's father, we've hardly talked about him. I think you said that he sits there and doesn't really say anything. You just kind of get the impression he doesn't really have much to say. Rosie is a very kind of domineering character, certainly the dominant one in the marriage. She kind of speaks for both of them, I think, which again is one of those stereotypes, but it's okay. And in the first two movies, he's Amy Heckling's dad, and in the third, he's somebody else. And we just briefly see him looking at something with Julie, I think, wearing a Santa hat, and we always say, oh, they put a Santa hat on him so we won't notice. So, very much reduced involvement from the Heckling family there, but it's still a very successful sequel to the other two movies, in my opinion. The Jeopardy at the end, which you held back on from talking about earlier for the sake of structure of the podcast, is where they all end up in upstate New York, kind of stranded in the snow, James having been tricked into getting stuck there by evil Samantha and Molly and the kids having driven up there in the cab with the dogs to join him and accidentally going off the road in the snow and getting into trouble with the wolves. By the way, the wolves also speak. There are other speaking dogs at the animal shelter and stuff. We like the Dalmatian, don't we? You could call me Spot or Measles. Please call me Measles. <laughs> yes, that's very funny. And at first it's just one wolf and that's a very camp performance. You know, on your way to Grandma's house, which is another very successful thing it's absolutely hilarious and the wolf says this to molly oh meals on wheels that's right referring to the cab of course and we see him again later with his pack telling them after Rox has fought him off he had friends and all that kind of thing he don't look so big to me and of course Rox comes through there fighting off the wolf finding James and leading him to the others and Daphne surprises herself and perhaps the audience but I'm sure we knew she would come through by finding the ranger station and alerting the forest rangers and getting the family rescued and taken to the ranger hut for the night that they won't all freeze to death so it's a satisfying conclusion for the two dogs and the role they play in it and for the culmination of family story and the plot with James and Samantha and it works well as a perilous conclusion. And shall we just tell everyone about Santa while we're at it? He's not real guy. Yes, as Mikey discovers, and I was saying, they were saying they've been together six years, that makes him seven, and you mentioned a couple of times, first you're surprised that Mikey still does believe in Santa, and then you remember how long it took some people at school to stop believing, and I remember when I was about seven, people were in my class arguing about whether there was any Father Christmas. What bothers us, doesn't it, is that once Mikey stops believing in Santa, they try Try and make him change his mind, make him go on believing. And the other movie where they do that, where a child doesn't believe, and they're like, oh yes, there's a Santa, there's a Santa, is A Miracle on 34th Street, of which we watched the remake with Mara Wilson and Richard Attenborough and didn't like it. Mikey is seven, probably going on eight. He's seen something that has confirmed to him, he's worked out the truth, Santa is just a story, and trying to convince him that Santa is actually real from that is rather crossing the line from telling your children a nice story to lying to them blatantly, in my opinion. So it does bother me a little. And on that note, another podcast comes to an end. But do join us again next time, which will be the final Sunday in October for a podcast on The Fly and The Fly 2. Another movie series with a slight change in genre and tone. So until then, Good night out there. Whatever you are.